Turn to the person on your left and on, on your right and say, Merry Christmas, fool. <laughs> Merry Christmas. It is by far my favorite time of year. If you came in after the second song, let me reintroduce myself. It is uh, Travis. My name is Travis Clark, and my wife is Jenna, and we both get to serve as co-lead pastors here at Canvas. And uh, if it is your first time, I just want to welcome you. I hope that it's not the last time uh, that we see you. Uh, God is doing so much in this church, and I don't know what brought you here. Maybe you're here because of Christmas. Maybe a friend invited you. Maybe you were just walking in the Presidio, stumbled inside, and now you're realizing this is a church service and you feel trapped. Either way, we're glad that you're here. We're really, really glad you're here. And so um, we hope that we continue to see you in the weeks to come. Canvas, if you call this your church home, can you show some love to our guests today? Give them a round of applause. Awesome. Well, we are kicking off our Christmas series, three weeks, uh, a series called The Advent Conspiracy. And I'll, I'll unpack a little bit what that is all about and what that means. But but I, I, I just love this time of year, and not just because of the lights and the music and the, the movies and the parties and all the festivities. I love all that, don't get me wrong, but like as a pastor, one thing I love about this season is it, is it always presents a challenge to me. It always presents a challenge to me because I have to present an old story in a new way. And chances are like all of you, or at least most of you that have come into this place on some level, you have some understanding of like maybe what the Christmas story is all about. So you're here and you're like, it's Christmas. I know what preacher man's gonna say. It's baby born to a virgin and that baby's gonna be pretty awesome. There you go, give me my donut. Let's head out of here, right? It's easy to just assume the ending when you come to a Christmas service because maybe you've become so familiar with the story itself. It reminds me a little bit of what the late Dallas Willard once said. He, he said, unfamiliarity doesn't breed contempt, but familiarity breeds unfamiliarity, and unfamiliarity breeds contempt. In other words, what he's saying is, the more familiar you are with something, you are vulnerable to becoming unfamiliar with what that is actually all about in the first place. Right? And you can hear the Christmas story again and again and again and, and assume that you know what it's all about, but then if I were to ask you, what is it all about? You might be like, I actually don't really know, right? And if, I wonder if I were to ask you today, you know, what is Christmas all about? And I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you to say it out loud, but I wonder what, what you might say. And chances are all of us would have different answers to that question. What is the Christmas story all about? If you were raised in the church and maybe this isn't your first rodeo, Christmas time in the church. You might be a fancy pants Christian and say, you know, Christmas is about God becoming man through the birth of Jesus for the propitiation of the sins of all humanity. And it's like, I guess I can't disagree with that, right? I mean, you said propitiation. That sounds so smart. But maybe for others of you, you know, you might have a variety of reasons or stories that you would say Christmas is about this. Maybe for some of you, Christmas is about family or friends or loved ones creating moments that you'll remember forever. Maybe for others of you, Christmas is about lights and decorations and, and parties and giving gifts to those that you love. Maybe for you, Christmas is all about that free red cup from Starbucks. Did anyone get their red cup? All right, nobody. Good, because Starbucks is trash. Go get better coffee. All right. <laughs> So, but maybe for others of you, it's like Christmas is about cheesy Netflix specials. Has anybody watched any cheesy Christmas Netflix specials yet? All right, Jenna and I, we ushered in Christmas. <laughs> I like people ask them like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like um, we watched, uh, I don't remember the name, but all, it featured Brandy. Did anyone know who, you know who Brandy is, right? If you don't know who Brandy is, you are so young. Um, but it was as awful as you would expect in the perfect way to usher in the Christmas season. What is Christmas all about? It's a strange story when you really think about it, isn't it? Like, I mean, imagine an alien came from outer space, landed here in San Francisco, and saw the lights and heard the music and the movies we were watching and saw all the festivities and parties, and this alien with no context of Christmas and our stories and the Bible or Jesus shows up to you and says, like, beep, boop, beep, boop, like, what is Christmas all about? And you would be like, well, Christmas is... Uh, it's about this Middle Eastern baby that was born to a high school girl under precarious circumstances. And this baby was going to become a really big deal. Like that sounds sort of like a strange story, doesn't it? It doesn't sound like the story that would stand the test of time and be talked about 
for the past 2,000 years, and yet here we are, still celebrating Christmas, still talking about this story, about a Middle Eastern baby born to a high school girl in the middle of the night in the Middle East. It makes you wonder, what makes this story so important? Why did it matter so much to the first audience that heard it? And why should it, or even does it matter to us here today in San Francisco in 2023? And today I wanna, I wanna hopefully help answer that question. In fact, throughout the next three weeks, as we dive into the Advent Conspiracy series, what I hope you'll see is that, that Christmas is this story about God conspiring for the good and hope and future of all humanity. It's about God meeting us right where we are. It's about God meeting us in the middle of this messy world and inviting us to build a better one right here, right now. It's this beautiful, messy, complex story. A perfect story for the beautiful, messy, complex world that we find ourselves in. And so we're gonna dive into the Christmas story and my hope, my prayer is that you will see this old story in a brand new way and that perhaps this Christmas will be unlike any other Christmas that you've ever experienced before. And so how are we gonna do this? Well, we're gonna talk about really three things today. We're gonna talk about Rome, we're gonna talk about rebellion, and then we're gonna talk about our response to it all. Rome, rebellion, and our response to it all. And what you're gonna find, I think, by the end of today is that the Christmas story is a little less Mariah Carey and a little bit more Rage Against the Machine. You're gonna find that the, the Christmas story is a little less about parties and a little bit more about protests. That the Christmas story is less about genetically enhanced reindeer and far more about resistance and about rebellion. Are you with me today? We're gonna dive in. Rome, rebellion, and then our response to it all. So let's talk about Rome first. During the time of Jesus, the world had one superpower, and that superpower was the Roman Empire. And the Romans traced their history back to around 750 BC, but it wasn't until around 500 BC that they really began to establish themselves. And over the course of the next 500 years, Rome would go from being a small city-state to being one of the most dominant forces in the ancient world. And how did Rome become this dominant empire? The same way that every dominant empire in history became a dominant empire. They had armies that were bigger and better and stronger than every other empire in the day. And Rome had the greatest army of all. And how did Rome get such huge armies? Well, they paid a lot of soldiers. And how did they pay their soldiers? They collected a lot of taxes. And how did Caesar know how much he could collect in order to pay his many soldiers? Well, they would, they would count the people through what was called a census which is where the Christmas story in Luke chapter two, verse one begins. In Luke chapter two, verse one, it says, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Now, I didn't see anybody look up in shock and horror. Nobody gasped when I said that Caesar Augustus decreed a, a census. And yet, if you were the first audience hearing this, those words would have struck deep. In those days, oh, they knew those days, because these were the days that Caesar Augustus reigned. And he was doing a census, which was just another reminder, if you were an Israelite man, woman, or child, that you were under the thumb of the Roman Empire, that you were just a number, that you were just a cog in the Roman empirical machine. And all that mattered was your ability to give so that Rome could become more and more powerful. So to the first audience, this, this, this phrase that there was a, a census, it would have reminded you that in this particular moment and in this particular story, the Israelites were not the winners. They were very, very much the losers because Rome was that powerful. In fact, Rome had no problem flexing their power to anyone and everyone that got in their way. In fact, there's one Roman historian, Tychidus, who who, uh, who wrote about one of the Roman conquests. And he wrote about the Roman conquests, and this gives you a little idea of like what Rome did and how they operated and how they thought. Here's what Tychidus said. He said, to extend the scope of the raid, 
that Caesar divided his eager legions into four bodies and for 50 miles around wasted the country with sword and flame. Neither age nor sex inspired pity. Places sacred and profane were raised indifferently to the ground. The troops escaped without a wound. They had been cutting down men half asleep, unarmed, or dispersed. In other words, what Tychicus tells us about Rome is that Rome was going from town to town and city to city and village to village, and they were burning it to the ground, leaving nothing behind but ash and rubble, and anyone who stood in their way would be killed. And it doesn't matter how old they are or young they are or what gender they were, if you stood in Rome's way, Rome would stomp you with their large empirical boot. This was the world, the backdrop, the context of Christmas. And the rise of Rome was powerful and it was quick and it, it was spreading to the corners of the earth and they wanted nothing less but world domination. And the question is, if, if Rome ruled the world in the time of Christmas, then, then who ruled Rome? And to answer that question, we gotta look at Jesus' birth. Well, history will tell you, but Jesus' birth also clues us in that, that Rome was ruled by rulers known as Caesars. Not like cute pizza delivery, pizza, pizza, Caesar, but a much more scary version of Caesar. And the first Caesar was Julius Caesar. And it was under his command that Rome really reached the height of its power. And at this point, Rome was actually run as a democracy. Rome was a democracy until Julius Caesar was killed. And then there was so much civil unrest in Rome that Julius Caesar's nephew named Octavian took over the throne and he took Rome from a democracy and now turned it into a dictatorship. And Octavian's name was turned from Octavian to Augustus Caesar. And we have a picture of Augustus Caesar right here, one of the more famous statues of Augustus Caesar. And if you're wondering who that little like guy is there in the bottom, in the bottom left of Augustus Caesar right there in the next slide, that little person symbolized humanity. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of what Augustus thought of himself. That he was pretty much a big deal and everyone else, yeah, you're, you're like right at his ankles. This was the mentality of the Caesars. And the most important Caesar that we're gonna have to know if you're gonna understand what the Christmas story was all about, at least from the first audience receiving the story, is that Caesar Augustus, this guy, was the one on the throne and Caesar Augustus is the Caesar Luke talks about in his gospel and tells us was in control. And Caesar Augustus was actually so powerful that people would go as far as to say that Caesar, this guy, was God incarnate on earth. He had a couple other nicknames. He referred to himself as the Messiah. He loved calling himself the Prince of Peace. And he had one nickname that seemed to really stick that everyone would refer to Caesar Augustus as, and that is the Son of God. As the worship of Augustus grew, so did the celebrations in his honor. For example, Caesar Augustus was known to pay 40-person male choirs to sing whenever he entered into the room. He would hire a choir to sing praises about how great Caesar Augustus was as soon as he entered into the room. I mean, Caesar Augustus was like Kanye before Kanye. You know what I'm talking about? Like the guy had an ego, to say the least. And then in 17 BC, according to popular legend, there was a strange star that appeared in the sky one night. Strange star that lit up the heavens and this star would be known as Caesar's Comet. And many in the Roman world believed that this star confirmed the blessing of the reign of Augustus Caesar. And with this heavenly blessing coming from this strange star in the sky, Augustus Caesar said that his cosmic hour had come and so he announced a 12-day celebration to declare his birth and to declare his blessing to the world. And what did they call that 12-day celebration? They called it the 12 days of Advent. And during Advent, it would be proclaimed all throughout Rome that the birth of Caesar was good news, or the word that they used was evangelion, which means good news or gospel. And according to this good news or gospel about Caesar Augustus, they proclaim that Caesar was the mediator between all people on earth and the gods of Rome. And that Caesar alone had the ability to forgive a lifetime of sins. As a result of this, people adopted a phrase that became very popular, so popular they would actually greet one another with it 
in the ancient world of Rome, and they would say they would greet one another with this three-word greeting: "Caesar is Lord." So now, knowing all of this, I want to now read the narrative in Luke's gospel of the birth of Jesus that is read yearly during what has historically been called Advent. And I want to read this, and let's see if we find some similarities between the story of Caesar and the story of Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, verse 1, it says this, At that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. And he traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Now, I want to jump to Matthew's account of what the shepherds did when they met Jesus. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, Matthew writes, the shepherds saying, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his, say it out loud with me, star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. Then you jump to verse 9. It says, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. Duh, we all would be. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. I bring you, say it out loud with me, good news that will bring great joy to all people The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, a.k.a. a choir, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven, and say it out loud with me, peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Now, us knowing the the backdrop of the world of Christmas and then reading the Christmas story in front of that backdrop, let's look at the comparison. Let's do a little Caesar versus Jesus for a moment and see the similarities between their stories just in case you missed it. For Caesar, his birth is celebrated during what was called 12 days of Advent. The birth of Jesus today is celebrated during what is called Advent. For Caesar, a star confirmed the divine birth of Caesar. For Jesus, a star confirmed the divine birth of Jesus. For Caesar, he hired a 40-person choir to sing upon his arrival. When Jesus was born, an angelic choir sang about his arrival. For Caesar, he was known as the Son of God. For Jesus, he would be known as the Son of God. Caesar was seen as a link to the gods of Rome. For Jesus, he was seen as a link to the one God, Yahweh. For Caesar, he was said to be bringing peace to the world. For Jesus, he was called the prince of peace for all. For Caesar, Romans declared that Caesar is Lord. For Jesus, the early first followers declared that Jesus is Lord. Now, some of you might be thinking to yourself, where are you going with this? What's the point of all this? Why does this matter if we're going to understand if the Christmas story matters here and now today in our lives? Well, here's what we have to decide, knowing what we know. We have to decide for ourselves, was all of this just a massive coincidence? Matthew and Luke, when they were writing the story about the birth of Jesus, did they just subconsciously, accidentally happen to create a story that just really works in parallel with the story of Caesar? Or is it possible That Matthew and Luke, as they're telling the story of Jesus' divine birth, that there's actually something else going on. That there's actually something humming underneath all of this, and there's something in between the lines that the first audience, at least Matthew and Luke, thought would pick up on. Here's what I'm suggesting to you today, and you can take it or leave it. But what I'm suggesting is that the Christmas story is far more punk rock than we give it credit for. That the Christmas story is far more edgy than the cute nativity scenes, Christmas songs, and storybooks, and Netflix specials lead us to believe. What Luke seems to be telling us is that 2,000 years ago, there was a rebellion born in a manger in the middle of the night in the Middle East through a baby named Jesus. And this baby was, at least according to Matthew and Luke, he saw him as a direct challenger to Caesar. 
a new king was in town. And this king wasn't looking to take empire further, the Roman Empire to the next level, but he was looking to build something entirely new, entirely better, right here, right now, on this earth. Have you ever known someone who's a one-upper? They're fun, right? If you're sitting next to them, don't like nudge them or something like that, but you know that person, right? You're like, man, I got a raise in my job. Like, no way, I became the CEO at mine. I went on a date and it was actually like normal. They're like, no way, I got engaged last night. I mean, one-uppers, man, they're not fun. But what I love about the, the gospel writers in the Christmas story is when you read between the lines, at least to me, it feels like they're trying to one-up Caesar. They're one-upping Rome. So Caesar promoted himself as God. And Jesus was like, nah, kid, I'm the son of God. And I didn't have to promote myself and give myself that title. God gave me that title himself. Aw, Caesar, you got a 40-person choir that you have to pay to sing to you whenever you enter into the room? Mm, Jesus, he didn't have to pay his choir, and it was an angelic choir, and they tore open the sky and praised God, not out of acquiescence, but out of love and adoration. Oh, uh, Caesar, you're going to bring world peace, but the only way you can think of doing that is through violence, through greed, through pride. No, 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 no. Jesus, he's going to create an entirely better kingdom, one that will, that will crush the Roman Empire, but he won't do it the way you do it. He'll do it through love and grace and truth and humility. So you have these, this sort of, I don't know, trash talking, it sounds like almost, happening between the gospel writers and the Roman Empire and Caesar. See, we have to decide that either the telling of the Christmas story just so happened to accidentally, coincidentally align with the story of Caesar, or the authors are telling us the Christmas story uh, in a way that the first audience would have clearly understood. And I guess we have to ask, well, how did the first audience respond to the Christmas story? If it was an invitation into sort of the right kind of rebellion, then you would see the first followers take the Christmas story as an invitation to join that rebellion. Did they do that? Well, history tells us that's exactly what they did. They often used the Christmas story to challenge the Roman claims. In fact, in the year 336, Christians continued to challenge Roman claims, and Christians used the Christmas story to challenge the story of the birth of the Roman god, Sol Invictus. And they challenged Sol Invictus by claiming that Jesus was born on the same day as Sol Invictus. And when was Sol Invictus's birthday? December 25th. Sorry to break the news to you. Jesus probably wasn't born on December 25th. Even the date of the birth of Jesus is rooted in rebellion. It's rooted in resistance to Caesar to the Roman Empire, because they had faithfully said yes to Jesus and the kingdom. See, the original Christmas story was always supposed to cause the original audience to ask themselves, who really is Lord? Who really is Messiah? Who really is bringing peace on earth? Is it Caesar or is it Jesus? See, Christmas would invite the original audience to ask the question, what really will make a better world? Is it the Roman Empire? Or is it the kingdom of God here and now in our midst? Now, I have a spoiler alert for you. The Roman Empire fell. Just like all power-hungry, violent, greedy empires do one day. They fell in 476 CE, and the empire built on all of those things, couldn't stand the test of time, but the Jesus movement um, is alive and well. Can I get an amen? The movement of Jesus is still here today and growing and is the largest movement in the world. Caesar Augustus used to be the most powerful person on the planet, and now the only thing that Caesar is useful for is for your salad before you eat your meal. What a downfall. 2,000 years ago, Caesar said no to Jesus and crucified him, but then three days later, God said yes to Jesus and raised him from the dead. So my question today is, and this Christmas, is what if Christmas is still an invitation to join the right kind of resistance? What if Christmas is still an invitation to join the right kind of rebellion 
in this world? What if Christmas is still about how God is birthing a better, more beautiful world than any Caesar or any empire could ever create? What if Christmas is an invitation into that story? What if it's not about the lights? What if it's not about the Netflix cheesy movies? What if it's not about the parties? None of those things are wrong. But what if it's about a bigger story, about a better, more beautiful world being created right here in this one? And it's an invitation for us today to say no to Caesar and no to empire because we have emphatically said yes to Jesus and joined the Jesus story. It reminds me of a quote by the late John Lewis. It's one of my favorite quotes of all time to be Fair. He says this, he says, never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. You know, what if the original Christmas is an invitation to make some noise in the world? What if Christmas is our point every year where we decide or re-decide to join God in getting in some good and necessary trouble in the world? And we start picking fights with Caesars and start picking fights with empires, because we know Caesar still exists today, right? Yeah, Caesar Augustus may no longer be around, but Caesar is anything or anyone that is crushing you or others. Caesar is anyone or anything oppressing you or others. There are Caesars that are robbing you or others of life. Some of you might work for a Caesar, right? Some of you have experienced Caesars in your life. They're the people that will inflate who they are in order to make you look smaller. That they will put pride and fame and fortune above you or anyone else for that matter. Rome was full of corrupt politicians just trying to build their own little empire. We haven't evolved all that much. Caesar still exists. And Christmas forces us to ask, who are you going to trust? Caesar? The voices of Caesars in your life or Jesus? And Christmas is an invitation to resist the beckoning of Caesar and to say yes to the way of Jesus. But not only do Caesars exist, we all know empires still exist, do they not? And Christmas invites us to ask this question, will we build just another man-made empire that will one day fall? Or will we be a part of building God's kingdom that will reign forever? Just like Caesars exist, empires do as well. You just turn on the news and you see it. That the posture of empires, putting nation above people, power above people, pomp and greed and exclusion and oppression, empires, they still exist. But so is the kingdom. The kingdom of God that entered into our space and time 2,000 years ago. I have really good news. Even in a messy, broken world that we live in, the kingdom is alive and well and advancing. And history tells us that wherever the kingdom shows up, the world gets better. In fact, according to historian Glenn Sunshine in his book, Why You Think the Way You Do, he says Christians were the first to oppose systematic slavery. Now, were there many Christians on the wrong side of history? Absolutely. But there were many, 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 many others who were on the right side of history opposing systematic slavery from the beginning. Historians credit Christian William Wilberforce of Britain as the primary force behind the ending of the international slave trade. A fifth century monk, Telemachus, is credited for being a pivotal force that ended the gladiator spectacles. And just drive around and you look at hospitals and many of our hospitals carry the names of Christian denominations. Why? Because it was Christians who funded those hospitals to exist in the first place. And if you even go to the Vatican and go underneath the original layer, you'll discover that before it was the Vatican as we know it, it was a hospital where people would bring the sick because it was known then that if you were sick and in need, that the church was where you went to find hope and healing. See, wherever the kingdom shows up, things get better, or at least they should. The kingdom should elevate every room it enters, elevate every space it fills. And Christmas is an invitation to say no to the way of empire, to say no to the ways of power and greed and pride and exclusion and violence, and to say yes 
to the kingdom of God that is building a better, bigger world right here in the midst of this one. Now, perhaps if you're anything like me, um, this might be the unsanitized version of Christmas you've been longing for. Like, I don't know if you've ever felt that during Christmas. I have. I don't know if that's okay to say as a pastor talking about Christmas, but like there's those moments where you're like, is this it? Have you ever thought that? Is this all Christmas is about? And for years I longed for a version of Christmas that didn't feel so sanitized, for a version of Christmas that could actually soar instead of the one where it felt like its wings were clipped. And today my hope is to invite you into that version of Christmas, the original version of Christmas, the Advent conspiracy that God is inviting all of us into that perhaps you've been longing for all along. Because maybe it's always felt like Christmas is a story for the winners. You know, maybe you thought Christmas is a story for the hopeful, for the joyful, for the victorious. And that's great unless you feel like you're a loser right now. Then it feels like there's no space for you in Christmas. What do you do when it feels like you're losing in your relationships, losing in your finances, losing in your marriage, losing in your faith, losing in your mental health? What, is it, what do you do with Christmas then? And for many of us, we've concluded Christmas is for the winners, so there's no space for me in Christmas because I feel like a loser. But can I tell you with grace and kindness, hopefully it comes across, you couldn't be more wrong because Christmas was first and foremost not a story for the winners. God didn't show up to Caesar. He showed up. To the last person you would expect God to show up to in the ancient world, he showed up to a teenage girl. And he didn't show up in castles, he showed up in a barn. And he didn't show up in the victory, he showed up in what felt like a loss. So if you're here and you feel like you're losing at life, I want you to know while Christmas might be for everybody, it is especially for you. It is especially for you. Because Christmas, first and foremost, was a story for those who are beat down and, and beat up and worn out. And so if you feel like any of those things, this is a story that God is inviting you into as well. Or maybe you feel like Christmas feels irrelevant when you look at the world around you. I've had moments this year, and I bet you have as well, where you're like, it feels wrong just chugging away at my hot chocolate listening to my Christmas music when there's a war that is taking the lives of thousands upon thousands of innocent people in the Middle East at that same moment. So what do you do with that? Where's Christmas in a world full of wars and greed and oppression and violence? How does Christmas even matter when we see the news? But when we understand the original Christmas story, not as Mariah Carey, but as Rage Against the Machine, not as not as parties, but as protests, not as reindeer, but as resistance and rebellion, then we find out that the Christmas story is made for the world we find ourselves in today because it is a story, not for the winners, but for the losers. And it is a story that invites you not to look away and be distracted from what's going on around you, but to look evil in the eyes, look injustice in the eyes, look brokenness in the eyes, and say, not on our watch, we will not stand for this. Christmas is an invitation, not to accept the world as it is, but an invitation to create a better one and a bigger one, not only for you, but especially for those who will live beyond you. And so when I pray that you would experience the Christmas spirit this year, it is not that I pray you will feel warm fuzzies as you listen to classical Christmas music in the morning, although that sounds awesome, I hope more than anything, the Christmas spirit this year for you is this sense that God is meeting you right where you are, especially if where you are is with a boot on your throat. That God meets you in your brokenness and God is meeting you in your fear and in your worry and God is meeting you if you feel like you're losing. You're like, I just can't get a W then you're the first person I believe God is showing up for this Christmas. And so when I pray that you would feel the Christmas spirit, I pray that you would feel the presence of this God with you wherever you are. And when I pray that you would experience the Christmas spirit, 
I pray that it would be like the spirit of the late John Lewis that says, I'm going to make some noise and I'm going to make some good necessary trouble because I refuse to accept the world as it is when God is inviting me to create a world that was always meant to be. And here's the good news. That baby in a manger would grow up to be Jesus, who would sacrifice his life on a cross for you and me. Rome would look to have the victory once again, but three days later, we would find out that Jesus actually is greater than Caesar, and the kingdom of God actually is greater than Rome, because Jesus rose again, and we're told he's making all things new. And Christmas is an invitation to join Jesus now in that important work here and now. So may we go out this Christmas and make some noise. May we go out and make some good and necessary trouble. And may you realize that you're not alone, even if you're losing And may you realize that the world that is, is not all there is. There is another world right here within this one, crashing into earth and inviting us to join in on all God is doing. Let's pray.